Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Washington. If you listen to President Obama, his State of the Union speeches, or other times he talks about financial reform and financial regulation, if you pay attention to mainstream media, if you listen to most mainstream politicians, you would probably come to the conclusion that Dodd-Frank, the financial reform bill that was passed by Congress and signed by President Obama, has kind of got it covered. We have financial reform. Don't worry about it. Well, perhaps that's not the case. Now joining us to deconstruct the real state of financial reform in the United States is Jerry Epstein. Jerry is co-director of the Political Economy Research Institute, Perry. He's a professor of economics at the University of Amherst, Massachusetts. He's published widely on a variety of economic policy issues. And he's recently written a blog called Banker's Assault on Financial Reform. Jerry now joins us from the Perry Institute in Amherst. Thanks for joining us again, Jerry. Thank you, Paul. So, so perhaps we're not so safe as we thought. Uh, what, what, give us your kind of overall take what's happening, and then we'll kind of dig into some of the issues. We're not safe at all. Uh, Dodd-Frank uh, has not been implemented. Uh, the way it was written, it left the field open for room, hundreds of rules that had to be made by various regulatory agencies, which basically allowed the bankers to come in and uh, spend uh, millions of dollars lobbying to gut the rules uh, and to do at, in the regulatory stages what they couldn't do uh, in the congressional stage a couple of years ago. So the bankers have spent hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, the latest estimates uh, were well over $100 million last year trying to gut Dodd-Frank, and they have a multi-front strategy that so far has been very successful. And then this was part of the criticism uh, I know, I think you had mentioned, and we other interviews we did at the time on The Real News, was that some of what Dodd-Frank was should have been more law, like you cannot do this, versus regulations will figure out what you can do or can't do. Because once it's in the realm of the regulatory environment rather than straightforward law, then the regulatory agencies are subject to, number one, all this lobbying, and two, uh, what partly, or to a large extent, what the Republicans are pushing is just simply underfunding these agencies so even if there is a regulation, they can't do anything about it. That's right. And uh, the, as I said, there's this multi-front strategy. One is to underfund the agencies that have to make and enforce all these rules, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, CFTC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC. Uh, the Republican-led Congress uh, are trying to underfund these. They're also bringing lawsuits uh, against these agencies when, when uh, they make rules that the banking lobbyists don't like. They're putting forward uh, weekly bills in Congress, in the House of Representatives, to gut these rules even further. Um, so the reg this process is completely being uh, taken over. But let's dig into some of this. One of, one of the issues that was most talked about was something called the Volcker issue, which was supposed to limit and contain proprietary trading. So first of all, tell us why that matters and then where, where are we at with this Volcker rule? Well, proprietary trading rule, uh, the Volcker rule, is important because these large banks like J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, and others uh, took on um, billions of dollars of, of debt and they used that debt to uh, create uh, dangerous products like collateralized debt obligations, uh, um, credit default swaps and so forth, uh, uh, sold these uh, to unsuspecting uh, customers. And then when the crisis hit, they had to bring these products back on their own balance sheets. And uh, this pushed all of these banks into virtual insolvency, and the government had to come and bail them out. So the, the Volcker rule was designed to prevent these banks from taking on so much risk so then the taxpayer wouldn't be on the, on the hook again. And uh, the rule was written in such a way that it had a strict bright line against proprietary trading, but even when it was written, many uh, loopholes were put into it. For example, an exception for market making uh, by these, these banks um, and hedging uh, by these banks. Uh, those were problematic enough, but in the writing of the rules, uh, the banks have come in and broadened those uh, those exemptions so that now they can drive uh, barrels of money uh, through them. Uh, and uh, the rules have gotten so complex now that uh, the Federal Reserve just came out and said, well, it's so complex, we're going to need another couple of years before uh, it's really going to be implemented. 
And the bankers like Jamie Dimon and others are coming out and saying, oh my gosh, this rule is so complex now, let's just gut the whole thing. So in fact, this was part of their strategy. Didn't Volcker himself said he thought this could have been written on one piece of paper? Yeah, Volcker himself thought, look, let's just have a really one bright eight. line uh, uh, against proprietary trading. Let's have the, the heads of the bank sign um, uh, a piece of paper saying that they're uh, not going to engage in proprietary trading, hold the heads of the banks accountable. Uh, so he thought it could have been done much more simply. However, uh, even Volcker says, look, even though it's more complex now, it still would be a lot better than, than the way we were before. But it's been put off two years, and two years from now they can make the same argument. And I guess they're also trying to put it off, hopefully, for them to have a Republican administration, which means they'll even have even more success than they've already had. Uh, so, the, so the delay helps in many ways for them. That's right. It's a, it's a waiting game for them, and uh, they're banking on um, more Republican support. The, uh, the, the odd thing, of course, is that Rep Republicans are running on an anti-bank, uh, populist kind of uh, platform, but it, they're doing nothing but supporting the, the, the big banks. And even a number of Democrats are going along. Well, I, I thought I was just about to say, it's not like the Democrats you know, pushed what Volcker himself actually wanted was a straightforward law, a simple law on this issue. The, the Democrats in charge of this process, you know, collaborated with the Republicans in making this process so complicated and so open to lobbying. So it's not like they didn't have a chance to do more than they did. There were some strong Democrats uh, pushing for, for better laws, and, and, and sometimes uh, they prevailed. But th that's right, there were a large number of Democrats who were reluctant to have. Yeah, there were in individual senators and Congress people that were fighting for something more. And now we're seeing the same kind of thing happening uh, in Congress itself, in the House of Representatives, where uh, weekly the Republicans uh, dominated House puts up these bills to broaden these uh, exemptions even more. And some of them are even sailing through the House with, with broad Democratic support. So let, let's talk about another part of the major issue that was supposed to be regulated. People said it was critical that it was. And that's the issue of uh, off, off over the counter and unregulated derivatives. And, and, and am I correct? The size of this derivatives market, it, it, what they call dark markets, I think, is, is something like 600 trillion. Like, it's, what is it, three times bigger than the global economy? And it's essentially unregulated? That's right. Uh, it's massive. It, it uh, was essentially un unregulated. One of the major achievements of the Dodd Frank Act was to. Have, to bring at least a large part of this under scrutiny uh, and under regulation. And now uh, a lot of the emphasis of the financial lobby, and not just the finance, financial lobby, but the commodities traders, um, the oil speculators, uh, a, lot, a lot of what they're trying to do is prevent this market from having uh, any regulation at all. And um, so there was a recent ruling by the uh, Commodities Futures Trading Commission that raised the bar uh, so that so many of these firms that engage in this kind of uh, derivatives trading uh, will escape regulation. The original bar was uh, firms that have fewer trades than 100 million uh, a year uh, would, would not have to be regulated, but everybody above that uh, had to be regulated. Um, and that would have captured about 70% of the firms. Uh, they recently raised the bar to 8 billion uh, average uh, trades in a year, and so more than 80% uh, of the firms will escape any re regulation at all. And even the largest firms probably will be able to escape by separating their trades into different subsidiaries offshore and in other locales. And so that uh, at this point, if this goes through and continues, um, this, this attempt to regulate this unregulated market. How did that get through the... Uh, uh uh, future Trading Commission. How did, it, how did it get through there? That's controlled by uh, supposedly three Democrats. Well, uh, th there are uh, several Republicans there and uh, not all the Democrats are on, on board. Part of it is uh, the massive campaign contributions. The, the, the financial lobby has spent hundreds of, uh, as I said, hundreds of mi millions of dollars. Uh, but also the, the Commodity Futures Trading Corp com uh, Commission and the SEC, they're intimidated now. Uh, because um, if they go against these uh, lobbies, then the lobbies bring lawsuits uh, uh, and, and try to, to, to bollocks up the process that way. So there's a great de degree of the intimidation going on uh, of, the of, of the regulators now. 
I mean, that's a crazy, you raise it to $8 billion, uh, it's, 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 it's totally escapable. That's right. And a lot of this, as I suggested, is for the big commodities trading firms. Uh, it's, it's not just what we think of as the, the, the banks and the, and, and the derivatives trading uh, financial institutions. Okay, so there's another issue, which is uh, a bill passed the House, H.R. 3336, I think it's called, uh, the Small Business Credit Availability Act. What's the significance of that? Well, first of all, it has nothing to do with small business. And, and part of the annoying thing about this is they always name these bills uh, so that if, if people vote against it, they can go out and campaign against them saying, oh, you're against small business. But once again, this was to take this basic $8 billion exemption that I talked about and extend it even further uh, so, uh, so that uh, firms that are engaging in these kinds of derivative trades and so forth will be able to escape uh, scrutiny. So this is whittle, whittling away even more so that 15% that might have gotten caught uh, in, in the regulatory net before are now going to be able to find it uh, easier to, to escape. And this, this kind of bill, uh, it took a massive lobbying effort on the part of Americans for Financial Reform, Better Markets, and uh, other groups to just get um, you know, 70 or, or uh, you know, to just get 100 Democrats to vote against it. It still passed the House because the Republicans voted party line, but um, it's a big effort just to even get a, a subset of the Democrats to vote against these things. Yeah, I think it's an important point that to the extent that there is some movement, uh, regulatory movement, uh, a lot of it is a result of a lot of grassroots organizing. Uh, I interviewed Bart Chilton, who's a member of the uh, uh, commodity Future Trading Exchange, and he said that he was seeing a hundred industry lobbyists, if not more, to one reform lobbyist, but still there, there was a presence there of reform lobbyists, which I think is important. People are fighting on this, but, but when something does get passed, uh, even if it's weak, like the, the position limits that were passed, uh, now the industry is going to court to fight the fa even fight the idea that there can be uh, limitations on position limits. What's going on with the court cases now? There are a lot of court cases, as I said, and, and uh, they're using uh, these rules that, that say that there has to be a cost-benefit analysis done to show that uh, imposing regulations um, do not impose greater costs than the benefits that are gotten from them. So the presumption is that deregulation or unregulated markets is best, and so in order to uh, regulate these markets, there has to be a hurdle uh, gone over to show that uh, the benefits uh, outweigh the costs. Well, this is completely uh, 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 putting mud into the regulatory works. I mean, it's completely backwards. We know from experience that the deregulated markets um, have caused uh, these, uh, this enormous uh, recession, depression that we're in. Uh, so the Congress, in choosing these rules, has already made the uh, decision and the analysis that the, the benefits um, outweigh these, these costs. So this is just uh, a tool uh, b being uh, used to try to prevent this kind of regulation. Well, it sounds like it's a delaying tactic. I mean, if Congress can't decide what's of, in benefit of the society and they do the cost benefit judgment and then they vote on something. I mean, how can you do that in a court? It doesn't make any sense other than to delay the whole thing. That's right. And it's very costly uh, to, to, to try to do these kinds of analyses. So you have to hire lots of quote unquote experts and it's hard to find experts that will do reasonable jobs on these things. So it really is uh, a way of just trying to gut this regulation. All right, so the argument the banks would make, if I had a banker here, he would probably say, if, the, if I can try to put words in their mouths, uh, okay, maybe all of what you're saying, there's some truth to it, but the bottom line here is if the banks don't have liquidity, they fall. So all of these measures are going to limit bank liquidity, and, and that's more dangerous to the whole system than anything else that's going on. So you better get out of our way, otherwise you're, this, these measures are going to cause the problem. That's right. Uh, Cost-benefit analysis is one set of boring economics terms that, that they're using uh, in, in their, the banker's defense. And this notion of liquidity is another one of these uh, arcane terms. Uh, one of the really powerful ways in which the banks have been operating is that they have gotten their customers to support them uh, in gutting this regulation. Uh, and they've gotten the customers to say, well, look, uh, we need liquidity uh, in order to, uh, to sell our bonds, in order to uh, do our investments. And if you impose the Volcker rule or you impose these other kinds of regulations, uh, that's going to 
inhibit the ability of banks to provide liquidity to these markets, and our cost of borrowing and our cost of investment is going to go up. And you have economists, there's some very well-known economists like Daryl Duffy at, at uh, Stanford University uh, who write these uh, papers um, are trying to show that uh, you, know, you impose a vocal rule that's going to make liquidity dry up and it's going to harm uh, the economy. Uh, the, the really uh, silly part about all of this is they, they use data from the financial crisis itself when uh, the banking system uh, crashed. And yes, liquidity did dry up, and yes, that did have negative effects, but the reason the banking system crashed in the first place is because these banks were engaging in all kinds of uh, uh, proprietary trading, uh, using all kinds of uh, liquidity inappropriately, um, and it's precisely that kind of trading and that kind of inappropriate liquidity that uh, rules like the Volcker Rule are meant to, to uh, prevent and uh, to prevent these crises from continuing to happen. I mean, they're sitting on a, what is it, a, one, a trillion and a half dollars right now, and they're worried about liquidity? That's right. The fact that the banks are sitting on uh, almost $2 trillion uh, of excess reserves and the corporations are sitting on another trillion or so, uh, there's uh, plenty of liquidity uh, in the market. And in the next bubble, if we don't impose these rules like the Volcker Rule, uh, the liquidity is going to go into all kinds of, of risky and toxic products that will crash the system again. Well, as you said in your opening of your blog, uh, the bankers are fighting this. They, for now, seem to be winning. And to quote you, uh, then they're going wee, wee, wee all the way home. That's right. And uh, as you suggested, uh, the, there are a lot of, of valiant and smart and hardworking um, activists uh, from the Americans Financial Reform and Better Markets and the AFL, CIO, and others, safer uh, group here, Senator Perry. Uh, but we need more help. We need more support. We need more economists and others to fight against these things. All right. Thanks for joining us, Jerry. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.